not a domain or subject expert. I'm strictly here to be a facilitator and to be a student along with everybody else. Aaron is the closest thing we have to an expert. Not only is he more than 50 miles from Lexington, but he is also a fearless leader. So um, he'll step in um, to help me um, appreciate the differences between Babak 2 and Babak 3. The intention is that for these nine sessions after this one, that you will have had time to read the material in the bad box or the, the specific chapter that we'll be dealing with and time to review the slides. And many of these uh, chapters actually have over 100 slides. So it'd be literally impossible to get through all the slides in any kind of depth. So what I'm hoping is that you'd have the time to be able to read the materials and then to see if there were specific questions or something that you wanted to go over. Chapters one and two, <clears throat> and in fact three, are a little bit different in the sense of how they're structured. And so we'll go through those slides tonight and try to give a little bit more weight to that and, and, and preparation, because I'm assuming that most of you got a chance to see today or yesterday for the first time the, uh, the material. So um, I, I'm assuming that everybody had <clears throat> a successful receipt and uh, of the zip file and was able to uh, at least extract the material since you have it available to. Does anybody yeah. have uh, problems or issues that they that you do not have the material? Uh, I'm, I'm okay. Back. Okay. All right. So I'm currently for those of you who are video challenged, I'm currently displaying slide four which is basically the agenda uh, items that we're gonna review for chapter one and two. And so that's uh, going over what is the purpose of the BABOC, what is business analysis, what, who and what is a business analyst. And I thought it was interesting that as you read through the, the BABOC itself, the question that I was able to ask uh, our, our CIO uh, table last week was, uh, is, is there a business architecture or a business analyst? Are they the one and the same thing? And um, certainly one of the things that you see in Baybach 3 is the fact that uh, there are many different titles that are associated with it, but uh, uh, not just one. So as we move forward to slide six, there are some very uh, key concepts that are involved in chapters one and two. One is obviously defining all of the uh, foundational concepts that we end up with a, a similar or uh, typical uh, taxonomy and that we all are speaking the same language as we move forward. Um, so the first step that it does is undertake the def definition of what is business analysis itself and then whether that's within uh, a project or without a project, so uh, extending beyond a project itself. They'll talk a little bit about the structure of the Baybot Guide itself um, take a look at the core concept model so that that's something that we would all be able to identify and understand and keep that core concepts, work our way through some terms, and then obviously the requirements of stakeholders and the design. So <clears throat> for those of you who aren't familiar with BEBOC 2, uh, I think Aaron, you mentioned the other day that, that BEBOC 3 is literally double the size. We've gone from 200 and some odd pages to 574, I think it is. And, and so there's been a lot more uh, information put in. There's been a greater rollout of the information dealing with Agile and that project methodology itself. And, and so that's now a complete uh, section as opposed to previously when it was just a subsection. The uh, purpose of the BABOC, as you can see on slide number seven, is the first to define and provide a globally accepted uh, uh, definition of what the business analyst profession is and to try to make sure that we define what the necessary skills are for business analysis. And um, as you talk to different people in, in industry, we find that the definition of what business analysis and those skills are that are required are, is, is not uniform. And it's something that, um, for example, I work a lot with project managers and, and through the PMI Project Management Institute, and it is much more um, structured in how people understand the role of a project manager and uh, um, the skills that they would be looking for for a project manager. So I think this is an area that we still have an opportunity to influence uh, our constituents and our leaderships to begin to appreciate what that uh, 
the skill and the, and the definition really is. <clears throat> in order to be able to build up a body of, of students and of, uh, by the way, Aaron, are you sharing, are you recording this at this point? Yes, I am. Okay, great. So we have this for anybody who might miss it. Um, the next step that we've got to, we have to work on is obviously setting the knowledge and the skill expectations so that when we start talking to people who are in hiring positions, whether they be first or second line managers or people within an HR organization, that they begin to understand the, the depth and breadth of a business analyst and what the, the practitioners in that field are, are capable of providing to an, an agency or to an organization. We also will look at the framework so that you take a look at what are the different business perspectives. I think one of the things that we heard loud and clear last week from different CIOs was that it is primarily a business-related role in the sense that we need people who are able to articulate and to view um, items from a uh, processes and, and problems it's from a business perspective. And even then, it might even be from a customer perspective in towards the business. And that technical knowledge of things such as IT um, or, or systems or applications is almost secondary. And then finally, they uh, wanted to talk about how we apply uh, business analysis to projects or to the complete, as it's described here on slide number seven, the enterprise evolvement and the continuous improvement aspects. And that's not always fully understood. I know that in this, the organization where I work, a lot of business analysts are tied to the business, but they are specifically tied to the business in terms of how are we going to um, apply the needs to an IT system as opposed to necessarily just a single process or process approach. Anybody have any uh, comments or, or additional concerns or anything that they'd like to raise at this point before I move on to slide number eight? Um, one thing that I would uh, make note of, uh, Eric, was um, on the perspectives. Um, there are five perspectives that have, were introduced here in Bobak uh, 3, um, but IIBA has noted that there are many more perspectives or job titles that are included in the, the business analysis umbrella. Just these five are probably the largest and most perspective of our BA community and have been included in here in version three. When we get to version four, whatever um, later versions there are, you may see actually more um, uh, perspectives uh, included in those. Very good, well noted. And I think that as you take a look at this, um, and, and we talk about <clears throat> the bodies of knowledge, uh, these are ever expanding and certainly um, IIBA has expressed an interest in making sure that the practitioners who are both certified and those who are seeking certification uh, make their, their needs and, and uh, their desires of, for, for expansion understood by the organization itself. So when we look at slide number eight, we have this concept of the business analysis going beyond the project. I think one of the concerns that had been expressed for those folks who had been involved with, B, uh, with BEBAC 1 and 2 was that there was a concept uh, um, that, that heavily favored project-oriented work. And, and in fact, as I said before, in my own organization, we find that most uh, business analysts um, are heavily uh, projectized as opposed to being more of a system-wide or a process-wide approach. So we want to make sure here from this visual that we understand that there are going to be pre- and post-project activities. There are also activities that take place in terms of strategy. You see that as a third orange bullet uh, or bar that's listed down below. And that strategy analysis has to start prior to a project. You kind of have to know where you're going in order to be able to fulfill the, uh, the, the need. And therefore, uh, you need to understand what the strategy is for the organization before you move ahead. And finally, that the concept of solution evaluation, lower right-hand side, the blue bar, and you see that goes beyond the project. So if we think in terms of PDCA, or we think of any kind of those concepts where we're going to perform a project, we're going to then come out of that project, we have to re uh, provide another analysis as to whether we've actually met the target. So I don't know about you, I've had the... Uh, the good fortune or the misfortune, depending upon whether you take adversity well, to be involved with projects that could be considered technical successes, but were absolute failures when it came to adoption 
or utilization. It's because we failed to take a look at the uh, solution after the project was completed and ensure the fact that it indeed addressed the capabilities and then the requirements of the stakeholders. So um, as we go through these next sessions, uh, I, I am completely open to the fact that they should be interactive sessions and that you can either bring up uh, uh, opportunities that you've had or successes or failures or whatever. I probably have the, the good fortune on the other hand from most of you of being at the other end of my career compared to you. So I've had plenty of errors over the past 42 or 43 years that I can help illustrate and, and maybe uh, um, help you not have to commit those very same errors. Some of them you can't. When I started working, I was just uh, at a 30-year uh, party for uh, a colleague of mine, and I had to explain to him that when I actually started working, we didn't even have computers in companies. So we had to do everything the old-fashioned way, so bulletin boards and other things of that nature. <coughs> I think one of the key components that we want to look at here on, on uh, uh, slide number nine is this This first bullet is, is I think, actually critical. Enable change in an enterprise. And one of the things that we've discovered, so if you think about the change curves and how change has, has in fact changed or, or uh, modified itself over the course of years is that when I look back at, at how things were in the 50s, 60s, and even the early 70s, you saw change at a very slow pace. Things seemed to take root for four, five, six years, sometimes even a, a, a decade before things were going to be modified and move and change and, and, and uh, alter their appearance. The organization I work for, Lexmark, spent the first 23 year, uh, 22 years, I'm sorry, as a hardware-centric organization. It was all about the razor blade model, right? We sold printers, and then we sold ink and toner cartridges, and that was the very same concept that was used for a very long time. Uh, five years ago, we embarked on a completely different path. We began to understand the influence of, of um, unstructured data. We began to understand the influence of software and how things that had been considered as printers were now all in one devices that could handle workflow and do a variety of different things. And we had to be able to move and make changes. So what we've seen is if the 50s, 60s, and 70s had changes that had five-year or even 10-year change curves today, we're seeing much shorter change curves. And the enterprise has to be a lot more nimble in terms of how it approaches it. In fact, if you were in the cell phone market or the smartphone market, you basically have a six-month window in which you have active marketing and then your, your product has about a 12 or 16-month tail on the back end where it's going in through another change process. So one of the things that we have to do is become much faster at being able to define what our, our needs and what the types of solutions are that we're trying to approach. I see Brandy is joining us uh, in, in, here at this point. And we need to be able to articulate those, those types of activities so that we begin to understand how we're going to address the work going forward. And then finally, the design and the uh, descriptions of the solutions are going to be much more nimble today than they had been previously. On the strategic, tactical, and operational initiatives, uh, one, we have to help the business begin to understand what is the difference between strategic, tactical, or operational, and, and begin to uh, help them view the fact that not everything needs to be strategic. It seems to be that in a similar fashion, uh, 10 years ago, we had all kinds of money for reporting. Five years ago, we couldn't get money for reporting, but you could get money for uh, business intelligence. Today, you can't get money for business intelligence anymore, so you have to be talking about analytics or even predictive analytics, depending upon where your organization is. And yet, if we look at what is actually being used by people in terms of their daily needs for data and, and data collection and then uh, dissemination of data, over 80% of reports today are still reports that take a look at what did I do today, what did I build yesterday, what did I invoice, things of that nature, and most of them are not really strategic in nature. They are operational to make sure that you are either in conformance or performing according to your business plan. But when we go to take a look at strategic, a lot of times people don't know how to analyze and therefore the requirement for a business analyst to begin to appreciate what is the current state. Have I mapped out the current state and do I understand what it looks like? And if I don't understand what the current state looks like, how am I ever going to know what my delta or my gaps are in order to be able to get 
to the future state. And I think that's really what we see here at the bottom. So um, if I say the first thing is, if I, I have to understand what the current state is and be able to appreciate that, that may even talk about laying it out in terms of a level zero, one, and two, or however you divide up your leveling, and begin to understand how each of those individual steps or processes work their way through. I then need to define what good looks like, and good is essentially going to be the future state. And I'm assuming at this point that the future state is only an interim step because at the end of the day, when you, get, when you achieve it, you're more likely to then be looking at what is my next future state going to look like. But once I've defined the future state, we should be able to move on and uh, ensure that we have listed out all of the activities necessary to get us from where we are today to where we today believe that good looks like. I thought that on slide 10, I really liked this first concept of the business analysis perspective in terms of the lens. This is a lens with which we as analysts are supposed to view the business. Um, so the first part is, is agile. And I think this is agile more in a sense of being um, quick to adapt, quick to adopt, and quick to move as opposed to agile in terms of a methodology. We have to also be able to think of it in terms of business intelligence. It's not just about big data. The real questions really are, what's the questions that we should be asking with whatever data it is that we have? And in this case here, when we talk about business intelligence, in many cases, this is a backward view where we're trying to look at understanding where we have been and how we performed against what we thought good would look like to help us understand what the future should look like. Uh, for better or for worse, information technology is here with us to stay. Apparently, we no longer can read paper. Uh, we have to have it on our tablet or on our smartphone or things of that nature. Um, and today, for example, I was working with some folks in, so that to talk about the business architecture perspective. We were talking about a learning management system. In the old days, it was pretty, uh, and that could have been three or four years ago, uh, a learning management system was pretty basic, right? We we provided opportunities for people to click on and, and register for classes uh, if they were giving it as instructor led, to click in and be able to do self-paced web-based training, things of that nature. And today, yeah, sure, you still have those elements, but we also have to be able to address concepts that I want to jump from that courseware to the knowledge base. And I may actually be on a tablet or on a smartphone at a customer site and be able to bring up some kind of micro course or micro description of what a specific issue or problem might be. And so that leads us to the business architecture side because now you have people, I see we have a cat who wants to join the class here. <clears throat> we, have a, uh, we have a need to be able to uh, uh, help people understand how the scope and the breadth and depth of what it is that they're trying to work on has changed and they can't just have it uh, uh, as it used to be. And then finally, business process management. So depending upon whether you use APQC or you use some other kind of business process management listing, we need to be able to understand how business processes work. One of the things that we're trying to do in my own organization is help people understand that there may be a global policy that then has global process owners, and there may be regional or local or even cost center implications as to how those get implemented and managed as they work forward. The other concept is that we have to look at here is this last bullet, which talks about one or many perspectives may apply to an initiative. What we've discovered over time is one size doesn't fit all, and as a result, we obviously need to be able to provide not only multiple lenses, as you saw described up above, but what are the different business contexts in which we um, have to look at something. So, for example, again, in my own organization, we've moved from being a hardware-centric the one where we're pushing software more than we're pushing hardware from the analysis perspective. Anybody have anything they'd like to add, change, or uh, modify to those uh, concepts? So, Burgundy, you work for the state of Vermont. I'm assuming that a lot of what you have to do deals with, compl um, well, perhaps I shouldn't assume anything. Typically, uh, typically government agencies are concerned about compliance, they're concerned about a variety of customer facing things where they're providing information or, or gathering information and then finding the compliance. Do you see that as being any different than what I've described in terms of the business where I'm in a commercial business, for example? 
Um, I guess only in that um, some of that regulation and policy we view from a lens more of a constraint. Um, just because it's something we really don't have the power to change. But it is something that we have to abide by. Or at least have on some kind of a checklist for compliance purposes. Um, so depending on who is mandating the regulations, sometimes it's kind of it's included in the analysis and that, like I said, it's a checklist. We have to make sure that we're completing or meeting these standards, but that just sort of paints the box that the rest of the analysis is conducted within. Okay. So on, I know that I can tell you this, on the commerce side, we find regulations to be stifling as well. Uh, yep. Uh, I, I'm always amazed at, at how much people feel that uh, things like FISMA, FERPA, um, FedRAMP, HIPAA, and so forth are, are limiting, and yet most of those are fairly straightforward in terms of how they actually be applied and, and how they work through. Terry, over in Alltech, do you have uh, uh, much that, because you have some regulation, and certainly in, on, so on the brewery distillery side, you must have some, but I, I'm assuming on the, uh, the feed side, there may be some activity as well, so you may have some points that you may bring in. Shay and Brandy, um, I'm, I'm assuming that we have some issues around materials and safety and things of that nature for your mattresses and the products that you sell. I know that there's some tags or something or other I'm not supposed to rip off. Um, yeah, so, so oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, I had you on mute. Um, so we have the tags and by law, you know, we're required to have the tags on there. But also right now, because I work with IT, my customers are our business. Yep. Um, and I know that there are some regulations also around fire retardant. So we have to have mattresses that that meet those fire retardant standards and they have to go through fire retardant testing. Um, and even some states require that to be on the um, customer facing document. So. Sure. And then of course you, you do have European sales as well and Canadian sales. And so those have different rules and regulations as, as they go through. I think I can give you another example, which uh, I was working with a company a few years back where uh, they had to, they had uh, five or six different products that they were trying to sell. They were all based off the same product type itself, but because of language and packaging and so forth, they managed to, to create five SKUs out of it. We were trying to go for simplification and for uh, inventory improvement. And the, the way we were able to do that is we worked them through it and discovered that if they just were good enough to put all of the language options in the same box, in the same PC board or however you want to describe it, they would be able to get down to one single SKU that could be sold anywhere because we made the, the packaging conform to California as well as, nor, as well as the balance of the United States and also provided the languages necessary in order to uh, go through with uh, Canadian sales. Um, where so mm -hmm. we, we managed to reduce their skew proliferation, if you will, from that perspective. But that took an awful lot of analysis because nobody had ever looked at it that way, which was, so they were looking at it from an inventory control perspective, as opposed to helping them see how bad that perspective was for the distributor and for the end dealer in many cases who were waiting for something to show up that was back ordered simply because of a language pack when that could automatically be built right in. So if I move on to uh, number 11, anyone who performs business analysis activity is in fact or could be considered as a business analyst. So I think what they're trying to get us to understand here is, is what? This has nothing to do with your title. It has nothing to do with your role in the organization. It has to do with your attitude and your approach and how you want to handle things within your organization. So on the one hand, we don't want to, we, we don't want to denigrate the business analysis role or its name. We want to promote that as, as IBA. But the other thing we want to do is we want to promote other people thinking of themselves as being able to provide business analysis as well. So while it may not be their primary role, we don't want anybody just reacting to something. We want them and we want to help them come to the point where they begin to understand that they too can perform business analysis. And so part of that is that whole discovery concept. 
And then eliciting stakeholder needs, investigated, clarified desires, and to understand issues and causes. Don't know about you, but every day that I sit in meetings with people, I am amazed at the amount of detail people can delve into before they even understand what the full breadth of the problem is. Most of us have a habit of trying to, uh, uh, so let me see, how do I put this? We want to solve the symptom as opposed to perhaps approaching the root cause. So whether I take the 5Y approach or an Ishikawa diagram approach or whatever approach I might take, to try to elicit what the actual needs are, we find people trying to dive immediately into um, some kind of resolution without completely understanding what the issue is. So we need to help people begin to analyze what are capabilities that are required, and then from those capabilities, help develop the requirements and work our way through the systems. And as part of this, aligns and design delivered solutions with the needs. So we have to understand the enterprise problems and goals. Most organizations, have multiple divisions or have different uh, cost centers that have similar needs but may have completely different approaches to how they attract and, and, and work on different problems. So we need to try to raise that to the enterprise level. We need to be able to devise different strategies to execute whatever the corporate strategy might be. And then we have to help people drive change. And for most of us, change is, we like to say that we don't like change, but that's really not true because most of us have, have uh, Let's see, we probably went to school. We probably moved a couple of times. We might have taken the odd vacation. Aaron here is planning on some kind of cruise coming up. So that's change because I can see right now that, that the office or cube that he's sitting in isn't exactly a, a cruise liner. So we know that there's change and that we're not necessarily against that as we work our way through. And then <clears throat> something that's not to be forsaken is the concept of facilitating stakeholder collaboration. So while I personally sit in, a, in an office of three architects working on enterprise architecture for our organization, we're spending more and more time facilitating workshops with different stakeholders because what we find is the stakeholders are coming to a realization that they're not seeing things beyond their own cost center or beyond their own division and that they want to be able to see things in a broader sense. And that's putting extra strain on us but we, we actually are thrilled with the idea of being able to provide more workshops because as we see it now, we've moved from people saying, oh, for God's sakes, get on with it, to saying that they're not prepared to move forward with their suggestions until they've been through the workshop. We see that as a very positive statement. Any comments, concerns, questions on slide number 11? Okay, I take silence as being no, so we'll keep moving along. So some of the common job titles. This is one of the things I raised the other day with, with the CIOs uh, at the uh, meeting that we held at, at Bluegrass Community College. And, and is, is a business architect, and, and we at Lexmark have defined that as a separate and distinct role from a business analyst. So we see an analyst uh, as, as providing uh, inputs in terms of the of, of what they're dealing with where it says here business systems analyst and and that the business architects are ones that are more process oriented than systems or application oriented but again there are a variety of different titles here and as Aaron pointed out before those little three dots at the bottom just tell us that depending upon your organization it could be an infinite number of other titles um, that exist out there uh, we're now seeing a, a, a proliferation of some of these titles as they work their way through our organizational structures. And as we acquire companies, and we've acquired 15 software companies in the last five years, we're seeing that things like product manager, product owner, um, and, and data analyst are titles that, that are more often seen in software companies today. The next question that came up would be on, on slide number 13 was, what are the different knowledge areas uh, that, and what are the business anal analysis key concepts? What are the competencies that we seem to understand? And what's interesting about competencies is they're a little really different than skills, aren't they? I mean, the first thing I mentioned under competencies is behaviors. And so, and I trust you've all noticed the Canadian or in, the true English spelling as opposed to the American spelling of some of the words that, that you'll see throughout the uh, Bebok and the slide deck as well. Um, 
the behavior is listed first, and then some of the characteristics and knowledge and the personal qualities. These are all soft skills. None of these are the hard skills that you might be able to get a degree in or something of that nature. And what we're seeing is that <clears throat> there are really different kinds of behaviors, and we all have those behaviors, right? There are some people that we naturally warm up to, some that we don't. There's a concept that, that uh, Vision Quest has put out there, and it's an Indiana-based uh, consulting organization that talks about uh, a default, a defiant, and designed behavior. And, and well, all so default behavior as a concept says that you know you work nicely, you keep your head below the top of that uh, that that cube there, uh, Aaron. So you know you don't stand up, you just keep your head down, you keep working. That's right, duck, duck a little bit so nobody can see you, and you just keep your work going. The defiant and 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 so you're not likely to be part of a team or in collaboration with folks trying to make a lot of changes. <clears throat> defiant folks. Um, um, are, are a little worse than that, right? So if, if we see a, a person who keeps their head down and just goes along to get along, the defiant people have a tendency to be more uh, structured in their approach, and they may actually try to actively sabotage something or prevent change from taking place, and, and are, um, well, you could refer to them as sticks in the muds, pain in the neck, or your favorite uh, name at the end of that. And then there's the design behavior, which is people who are always looking to improve and to move forward. As it turns out, there's no such thing as a person who is 100% um, in any one of those categories. We all have some of those categories as we work our way through. And so the question becomes, can I make my behaviors more towards the design side and less towards the defiant side as I work my way through? There's always the concept of techniques, which is how do I actually do my job? How do I perform that? And then, of course, the different perspectives that they talk about. We'll talk a little bit more today um, about the key concept here, business analysis core concept model. There'll be some more information on the key terms. And then, of course, uh, um, stakeholders, requirements, and design. There are some basic knowledge areas that have been set up and you'll see the, the uh, graphic for it as we work our way through. The first is the business analysis, planning and monitoring. So there's some heavy duty stuff there. Elicitation and collaboration. How do we get the information that we need from our constituencies? And then how do we collaborate with them to, to turn that into something? Understanding what their life cycle management is. Too often we, we understand the requirement and then the actual execution, so we go through the plan and execute phase, but we're not very good at close out and then reevaluating and beginning to understand if we need that again. Working our way through requirements analysis and then the solution evaluation. Here's the, the slide that describes that, a slide number 16 for those of you who aren't on the video. Business analysis, planning and monitoring sits at the top of the slide, and of course, it ties directly to elicitation and collaboration as well as the requirements life cycle. So those are sort of the outer circle and they protect us. And of course, it'll also tie into the inner circle where we have to have, after we've done the solicitation collaboration, we need to be able to do some analysis. We need to be able to design and, uh, and do the definitions and then finally come up with a solution evaluation. And then we make our recommendations on how we move forward. Has anybody had time to take a look at this graphic and, and see if they have any comments on that? Aaron, you want anything you want to add about the graphic? Uh, not particularly the graphic itself. Um, it is interesting to know that, uh, you know, these knowledge areas have not changed much between version two and version three. Um, some rewording, um, a little bit of emphasis put on collaboration. I wish they had put a little more emphasis than what they did. Um, requirements lifecycle management is probably the one that's gone undergone the most change. Um, but, uh, you know, requirements uh, planning and monitoring, I believe, was called uh, business analysis planning and communication um, pre previously. Of course, strategy analysis used to be enterprise analysis. Uh, so some wording changes in that, some, just a little bit of restructuring, something like communications is probably in life cycle management now instead of with planning. Um, but other than that, these have not changed um a great deal um and the con but the content within them has certainly changed yeah so there's been some growth on that so so 
is it, it's safe to say that the the actual structure is is very similar in nature. It hasn't changed much, although some of the specific nomenclature may have changed for additional emphasis. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay. Somebody should write that down so we know that I've made a fair statement here. <laughs> All right. When we talk about tasks, there's a very definite definition of a task. Discrete piece of work. It can be formally or informally uh, uh, performed, but it is absolutely discrete. A BA task is universally applicable, so it doesn't matter what type of initiative you're dealing with, what you're working through. Uh, we have to recognize that all of us may perform some non-BA tasks as we work our way through. And the other thing that's important to remember is that the BABOC does not prescribe a specific process. And so your analysis can start with any task that you want to at any point in the, in the structure of the organization. When they look at how they want tasks to be uh, presented or what the format is, the first thing we need to do is to be able to describe the purpose. Why is it that we're trying to do something? We need to define what it is that we're doing so that we can continue to share that common taxonomy and nomenclature. Everything is going to be structured so that we have inputs, elements, guidelines, and tools, techniques, stakeholders, and outputs. It's a very structured approach that provides you a very simple way to put things together. You don't have to think about how this is actually structured. Uh, Eric? Yep. Um, back on that previous slide, um, you know, the uh, word discrete there, you know, it's defining a very identifiable piece of work. So, you know, it starts you perform work and it ends much like a project. So that's what's meant by discrete, um, very identifiable piece of work that you're going to do that, that has a, a start and has an end. Okay, thanks. Moving to slide 19. What are the underlining competencies? I think one key is it's not unique to business analysis profession. I think one of the things I look at is, is somebody naturally curious? Do you, do you accept what you hear the first time through? Or do you want to try to figure out whether that actually makes sense or not and whether it's the best way to approach something or not? That would be something you want to have. But the other part of it is beginning to understand what are the competencies in order to be able to be successful. So we want to make sure that underlying your competencies, we understand what purpose, definition, and effectiveness measures. This is a key one here. Are we able to measure whether we're effective or not in being able to get some process related materials through the organization itself? The techniques that are listed, and, and we'll see this in chapters four through uh, uh, ten, uh, <clears throat> 12, it's not an exhaustive list. It is a list that's representative and one that, that is known to work. Um, you can use uh, different techniques for alternatives or together. And uh, we adapt or create techniques to suit the situation. Depending upon the organization you're working with, you may be able to have all virtual sessions. In other cases, you may have to have in-person sessions just because of the way people work. You may also use other techniques for elicitation that you may not have to use for other types of organizations. And again, every technique is going to have a certain specific structure. What's the purpose of that technique? What's its description, its elements, and how is it used? When we look at perspectives, <clears throat> slide 21, a perspective provides a focus to the task. One of the issues that we do run into is if you, even if you identify the task, people are going to have different ways that they want to approach these. And we want to provide a certain focus so we understand how we're going to attack it in this instance, right? So it's specific to an initiative context. And most initiatives engage one or more perspectives. One of the things that I find interesting as you talk to your constituents and stakeholders, however you want to describe them, is frequently people within the organization look at from the inside out. How do you get them to look from the outside in, which is what's the user experience or the customer experience, and how is that affected, and can we make changes to our organizations as we work our way through? So that's where we actually get into the concepts of changing in scope, the analysis scope, the methodology, so forth and so on. So that's everything that they have on chapter one. So as you read through the Babbock, you'll that'll be your ch chapter one readings. When we look at chapter two, 
We're going to go over the core analysis concept model, again, the key terms, classification schema, stakeholders, and the requirements design. So we're going to move to slide 25, the BACCM. So it's a conceptual framework. So we need to be careful that people understand that we're always dealing in a conceptual framework with this. It makes no difference what industry vertical you're in, what kind of methodology or where you are within the organization. It's the same approach. And there are six basic terms that you need to keep in mind. Change, need, solution, stakeholder, value, and context. And everything that we do is supposed to be performed in this structure. This, doesn't, this hasn't changed much from, from number two, has it, uh, Aaron? Um, the core concept model itself was introduced in version three, so it wasn't uh, um, even in version two. Okay. So what is the BACCM? It describes the profession and the domain, and we have to understand that business analysis is a domain within the organizational structures. It provides sort of bit common terminology. You evaluate the relationships between all of these key concepts. We're trying to perform a better business analysis by holistically evaluating relationships among the six concepts. It's a completely different approach to how a lot of people naturally think. And then we want to evaluate the impact of those concepts. And then the key here, establish a foundation and path forward. This is how we're going to make our changes. So here's the core concept models. Very, uh, the orange is very bright. I, I don't know that. We'll, is there any significance, Aaron, that you can see to the orange versus the blue? Um, no. Um, there's a lot of orange in the new branding from IIBA. I just took it that somebody up at IIBA likes orange. Well, I don't know of anybody else using orange to be precise with you. You're up here. <laughs> All right, when we look at the uh, key concepts, change, the act of transformation in response to a need or improve enterprise performance deliberately and in a controlled fashion. So part of the reason why we want to be business analysts is to make sure that we're making changes in a controlled fashion. We don't want things to be a knee-jerk reaction. We don't want them to be as a result of a negative. Too often, Change takes place because someone's received a fine, we've got a, a delinquency notice or some other kind of activity that <clears throat> puts change in a negative light. Here we want to think of it as being an evolution and not necessarily just a revolution as we work our way through. The need concept is simply a problem or opportunity to be addressed or can cause change by motivating stakeholders to act or eroding and enhancing the value delivered by existing solutions. If you take a look at your own life, how you, how you may be working completely from a tablet or a smartphone now, or how you can access systems from home and no longer have to be in the office. I'm actually able to work from home two days a week and, and uh, have access to the same systems and be able to do all of those activities without having to think about it. So that we can see that there have been a real change in how things have taken place and that there's really a need to do more and more of that. We're actually moving to distributed systems, remote offices, the whole campus concept is, is, uh, is moving away. And then a solution is a specific way of satisfying more, uh, one or more needs within a context. So if you have the business context for that solution, that's going to be applicable, but only until the next time that you believe that there's going to be some change or a need for change. So this is part of the life cycle that we were talking about before, where we move forward and continue to revisit what was the original need and do we have to make a change as we go forward. I think one of the key things I took away from this slide was the resolving a problem for stakeholders or enable stakeholders to perform their jobs. Stakeholders, a lot of companies um, have different definitions of a stakeholder. In the purest sense, from a project management perspective, a stakeholder is anybody who can be affected by the project. And I think you see the same thing here. I think they did a nice job of, of laying it out and saying it with a relationship to the change, the need or the solution. So it can be anybody upstream or downstream from the work activity that you're dealing with that has a, 
has a stake in the game or will be uh, a victim or a uh, participant in the solution, uh, however you want to describe it. We want to make sure that the, the stakeholders are defined by their interest, impact, and influence. Not all of them carry the same weight. So here you see that they can be grouped by their relationship to the need. Some stakeholders are in form only. Other stakeholders are key participants and should be uh, providing you with whatever information it is that you need to work for. The value concept that was listed before is the worth or importance or usefulness of something to a stakeholder within a context. We need to make sure that whatever solutions we're coming up with and that we're working with the stakeholders on are pushing the corporate strategy forward. You don't necessarily want to spend any real amount of time on work efforts that um, are, are minimally uh, advantageous to the organization. There's also the concept of tangible versus intangible. 19 hours, zero minutes. So, don't know how it is with your organizations, but many organizations take a look at something and, and they weigh a tangible benefit much more so than they will an intangible benefit. I can measure a tangible benefit. An intangible benefit is hard to do. I often come up with the question of, well, what, does, what if it's just the right thing to do? It's hard to put a monetary unit to that, and therefore it's hard to get something like that financed. In some cases, you need to do it in order to be able to have uh, sustainability. You might need to do it in order to be a good corporate citizen. Those might be some of the reasons why you would have an intangible uh, benefit. Uh, the, the other way of looking at intangible benefit would be a, a cost avoidance as an example. And then there's also absolute versus relative values and those are something that, that is defined differently by each organization. When I talked about the core concept for context, it's uh, what are the circumstances, what's relevant to that environment, and then uh, the last bullet may include attitudes, behaviors, beliefs, etc. So the context is very important. Are you doing this in a context that is um, a good, solid business context, or is it an emotional context that you're dealing with? Are you dealing with losses or some other issues that you have to work your way through? Anything else anybody want to add on these here? Um, I would add, um, I watched a video that uh, Julian Sammy did uh, when he was with IIBA and when they were very early in the progress of working on Bobok version three, so they're probably a year old. Um, and they, he's got one where they've completely dedicated it to the business analysis core concept model. And he talks a lot about the thinking behind it, how it was developed, why it was developed, and um, uh, all the processes behind that. Uh, w one thing that came out of that was that in any of these six areas, any decision you make, any um, way that you look at it has an impact on all the other five areas. So um, how you define the problem will have control on who are your stakeholders, what is the value you're going to deliver to the uh, business. Uh, what is the context within the, that this project will uh, operate within? So any decision, any way that you look at uh, in any one of these areas, it has an impact on the other five areas. That's why if you go back to the core concept model itself, you see that there's a line that goes out of uh, each of those areas that goes to the other five areas. They're all interconnected. Um, and you, you really have to think about all six of these areas on any project that, uh, that you undertake. Right, so uh, the example I was using earlier about a learning management system, if I have both external to the organization and internal to the organization, uh, constituents or customers or stakeholders, however you want to describe it, if I only engage the breadth of stakeholders that are internal, I will miss the entire external view of what the user experience would have to be. So that's a critical thing to make sure that you have there in place. The I business also, analysis, I'm sorry? I also saw the uh, word behavior on that last one again with its uh, unique spelling. And um, you know that you, you said earlier the English uh, version, and it, it is, but it's also the Canadian version uh, because IIBA is a Canadian company. 
Uh, yeah. Even though you know hundreds of people were involved in writing this thing, and many of them were in the U.S. and all over the world, um, you will see uh, everything kind of uh, was translated to the Canadian um, version of things. Yeah, spell check works one way when you uh, enable it for Canadian English or, or English, British English. Yeah, that's where all the uh, tech writers were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, when it talks about applying the, the BACCM, so quality and completeness, what are the kinds of changes we're doing? What are the needs? What are the solutions we're creating or changing? Who are the stakeholders who will be involved? What do they see as value? At the end of the day, it's not what we see as value. It's the value that we generate, either for the enterprise stakeholders or for our customers. And what are the different contexts that we're dealing with? Key terms. Slide number 32 for those of you who are uh, visually challenged with us tonight. So the first key term is business analysis. We want to describe that as the practice of enabling change in an enterprise by defining needs and recommending solutions that deliver value to stakeholders. It's a very generic and all-encompassing statement that is not industry specific, is not process specific. Business analysis information. They talk about the board and diverse sets of information that the business analysts analyze, transform, and report. Doesn't talk about computer systems or anything else. This is about information, regardless of its format, structure, or its appearance. And then information of any kind, at any level of detail, uses an input or an output of business analysis work. So that type of information, and you'll notice as we go through the other chapters here, everything is, either, is an input, a technique, or an output. Design. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, the um, first of all, the chain or the definition of business analysis did change between version two and version three. Uh, it's a lot more uh, broad uh, now, and you know it brings the the concept of value um, into the business analysis arena, uh, which was kind of missing out of version two. So that's one of the big. Um, um, advantages of uh, version three. Uh, the business analysis information I've always had, uh, when I saw that in the public review, uh, I always had real trouble with that. And I, I made um, comments on, on that during the public review that they need to really remove this. Basically the way they say that, you know, any kind of information at any level dealing with business analysis work you're kind of saying anything and everything. Um, you know, that includes you know, all your input, all your statements from, from stakeholders, your requirements themselves, uh, process flows, whatever you do, uh, all your deliverables, anything is called business analysis information. And as you go into the later chapters, it talks about working on business analysis information and delivering business analysis information. And, um, you know, uh, from the business stakeholders uh, or the business management prospect uh, or perspective, you know, they're not going to make people available to work on business analysis information, but they will make people available to work on a solution. Um, so I still have uh, quite a bit of um, issue and, you know, um, concern in dealing with uh, you know, that broad of a definition of, of, you know, a new term. So I'm still struggling with that. Okay. I mean, at the end of the day, when you read that, it, it basically tells you anything that you're using in order to be able to complete your work, right? Yeah. It's pretty broad. When we talk about design, a usable representation could be a picture, could be a verbal document, or I'm sorry, a verbal representation, and it could also be a document. But it's key here is that it has to focus on understanding how the value might be realized by the solution if it's built. And I would add purchased, because in some cases you may, you may bring value by purchasing a system or some other kind of activity. The definition of enterprise, I think, is pretty standard. Um, I didn't see anything there that was worth uh, being concerned about. Uh, did you, Aaron? Uh, Processes, tools, and information. Um, this has changed a little bit from the um, 
public review. They had a lot in there about systems they use, and it even went into their customers and suppliers, you know, um, and that kind of thing. So it looks like they have, you know, kind of confined this and brought it down to the layman terms and the generally accepted definition of what an enterprise is, you know. Okay. So this does I, look better. <laughs> I think uh, if I take a look at this uh, third bullet here, for business analysis, enterprise boundaries do not need to be confined by the boundaries of a legal entity. Mm. I work for an organization that has over 150 legal entities. So in many cases, when we're dealing at the policy level or we're dealing at even the business process level, those tend to go across different business units and uh, different legal entities. And that's something that in the past has always been a little cloudy for people, but I think they did a nice job of laying it out. We talk about the organization and then the plan. I think these are the last uh, uh, primary uh, uh, key terms. Autonomous group of people under the management of a single individual or board that work towards a common goal. So that organization could be a cost center. It could be a center of competency or a center of excellence, any type of organization that does not have to be a legal entity. It could be something that's a subset of that. It does have, however, a clearly defined boundary. So it's doing something specific, right? It could be a center of competency around an application or around the business process. The plan is the proposal for doing or achieving something. So I think what's key here, and it would be key if you were a project manager as well, is to realize that a plan is not a um, schedule. A plan is a written document that explains how you're going to get from A to Z. A requirement, which is a usable representation of a need. So this has to be a way of either so pictorially or, or in a written or verbal sense, be able to actually represent what the need is in order to be able to um, move from your current state to your future state. It focuses on what kind of value could be delivered. So I think one of the keys we have here is often we describe requirements in terms of, of things that we can't do today. And what we're looking at here in the BABOC is that we're really talking about a requirement providing someone a, um, a, a value. So I take my capabilities that I need, I then um, devolve those so that I can describe into a requirement basis how I'm going to add value to the process or to the system. And I think the definition of risk is a pretty standard definition of risk as well. The effect of uncertainty and the value of change. What I like about this description is a risk can be both a positive and a negative. Well, I'm sorry, a positive or a negative. I shouldn't say and. Um, and. And so you need to be able to understand what the risk is both from a positive and a negative perspective. You need to collaborate with your stakeholders to identify, assess, and prioritize risk. Not all risks have equal weight. Not all risks have an equal probability of, of taking place. And not all of them will have the same impact as they work their way through. The business requirements are defined as the statements of goals, objectives, and outcomes describing why the change has been initiated. There has to be a reason why people want something to get done. And then um, on the stakeholder requirements, we need to be careful because we, when we work our way through capabilities and requirements, each stakeholder group could have different uh, requirements. And in some cases, we have to be able to come back and combine those or be able to modify some of them so that uh, more than one stakeholder group can, can be able to understand and appreciate the specifics of their requirements. And it does talk here in the last bullet as serving as a bridge between the business and the solution requirements. So I may have capabilities and requirements as a business unit that I want to have explained and, and taken care of. And I may have to have a solution or a system or an application that's put in place, but it is really the stakeholder requirements that will drive us towards that concept, that, that bridge that you're talking about here. Thanks. Solution requirements are here. They talk about the capabilities and qualities of the solution to meet those requirements that the stakeholders gave us that we previously described. Appropriate level of detail. One of the things that you want to be careful of is that you don't have too much detail or too little detail. 
The transition requirements will tell us how we get from A to Z. In many cases, we may not be able to get there in a single step. You may end up having to have interim solutions and then be able to move from there. So you need to be able to understand that. Things that are included in that are data conversion, training, and business continuity so that you know how it is that you can move from your first position to your second position. Uh, I'm going to go quickly here. I'm not going to spend any time on stakeholders. You can define stakeholders as almost anybody within the organization. These are the primary stakeholders that they have and that repeat themselves through. Uh, we talked previously a little bit about what stakeholders are and who they are, so I don't think we need to work on that. And uh, I'm going to, in the interest of time, skip the actual definitions that they have here of each of these, unless somebody on the phone or uh, – on the video here, who would like to talk about any specific uh, stakeholder entity to make sure that they uh, have a full understanding of it. Otherwise, what I'm going to do is um, move forward here, and I suggest in the, uh, why don't we take a five minute break? Aaron, you want to suspend the, the recording and we can take a, it's now 9, uh, 7.15. You want to take a break till 7.20 or 7.25? That sounds good to me. Okay. All right. We're going to take a break. We'll come back at uh, in 10 minutes at uh, 25 after the hour, and then we'll uh, pick up from there. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Oh. What did you bring me?